always the bridesmaid, but alas, never the bride. Today, we're dispelling this. And I am honored to have us all here as witness to his ascension to the altar as betrothed to the one. And of course, I'm speaking about the one, the only, Deacon John Stewart from Gnostic Wisdom Network. So, John, welcome. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the great intro. And we're getting that joke uh, about uh, the bridesmaids and uh, being the bride. You know, I'm always shooting my mouth off on my own podcast. People rarely have me on as a guest. So that's it's an actual real pleasure. This might be the third time in my entire life. We were talking backstage about being humble, right? You know, I just want to put out there that I, I'm the most humble person possible. I'm much more humble than anybody watching. And I think if anybody would want to contest their humbleness, it couldn't compare to mine. But that said, I feel like I'm pretty good at shooting off my mouth. So everybody who's watching who has a podcast, uh, book me in the future. But also, as we're talking backstage, I spawned, recently had a baby. Well, my wife had the baby. She did all the work. But, uh, you know, I, I'm around. I'm doing stuff, too. So that's made things uh, a little bit more challenging. And to wrap it up with a book, happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, I've always been kind of a religious person. And I grew up on a small island on the east coast of uh, Canada, Prince Edward Island. It's the smallest province. And my immediate family was not particularly religious. So we did go to church where they sent me to church. They sent me to Sunday school. And I think that was just because I'm old enough that 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 would be the expectation at the time. What do you do with kids? Kids go to Sunday school. You know what I mean? Although my grandparents were more religious, more formerly religious. And even at a young age, you know, I sort of had a mystic thirst, a mystic quest. I always wanted to feel very close to this mystery. And also at a relatively young age, and I'll admit it through science fiction, the works of Philip K. Dick, you know, I kind of found out about Gnosticism. So, you know, this is like 10, 11, 12, you know, reading sci-fi novels uh, and encountering his. And at a young age, sort of looking for that material and, and thinking back in the 90s, wow, I would love to be a modern Gnostic. I'd love to join a, a Gnostic church. And Bishop Heller's Ecclesia Gnostica, of course, has been running since the, the 70s. He has his website, which has been running, you know, for a long time. It was up in the 90s. So I read about his modern Gnostic church, but it, it's very centered in just a few locations, right? So I'm like, well, that's nothing I'm, a, I'm ever going to be part of. I'm probably not going to live in LA. So I, I kind of set that aside. I was a bit of a spiritual seeker, though. I was more or less happy in the, the liberal church that I grew up in, even though within that liberal church, you know, there, there's not a lot of mysticism. Yeah, You know, I like a lot of the social teachings. I like a lot of the community aspects, but that mystic essence and practice wasn't really there. I got into meditation. I sort of sat with some different Buddhist groups. And then in my 20s, you know, always thought of myself as a religious person, kept an interest in religion. Um, I did my undergrad in religious studies, right? So that, that stayed a passion, the sort of academic study of religion. But, you know, through a number of factors, just sort of drifted away from actively being part of a community, actively doing any practice, what have you. But, you know, when I turned 30, I started to feel a call again to, to look for something, to go back to searching. And that's how I found the Apostolic Yoanite Church, which is a, a modern Gnostic church that draws upon multiple lineages, many that go back to the 1800s. There was a, a Gnostic revival in France then. And uh, I really liked what I found. I will admit that I was cautious sidetracking for, for a little bit. I should also mention anything I say. I'm not representing the Apostolic Joanite Church, uh, which is a mouthful. So from here on in the AJC, this is just my personal blathering. You know, what's funny is one of the hallmarks of a cult is actually how much they talk about that they're not a cult. But, I, you know, because Gnostic movements are small and quirky, there are some out there that are not related to us in any way that kind of use the Gnostic name and, and are much more of what people think of as a dangerous, small religious movement. But what I encountered the AJC, you know, I was wary, having my religious studies background, knowing people who had joined unhealthy spiritual communities. So, you know, I stuck a toe in and then my whole foot, and then my whole body. So, you know, I, I was able to, to move in cautiously, but I really liked what I encountered. And from there, I started a local group as a lay leader. And I liked how that was going and wanted to kind of bring it to the next level. So I joined their seminary program, which is engaged with remotely and uh, formally ordained as a deacon. So I have a small community here in Montreal where I live. We meet every two weeks. In many ways, it, it kind of functions as a Christian meditation group, to be honest. Uh, we, we do celebrate communion, the, the Eucharist. Uh, as a deacon, I can't uh, do the whamma jamma to consecrate the host, but um, my bishop has supplied me with consecrated hosts. The AJC has a 
kind of meditation based, contemplative based mass. So we celebrate that sometimes. And then other times more of a meditation beach. Although I do want to start to offer, you know, kind of a variety of experiences while still having continuity. And I need more practice celebrating the more formal masses, traditional masses that, that the AJC does. So many things I just noticed we have in common, like your introduction to this spiritual conception through the vehicle of pop culture. Same way with me. I came into it through things like music. I was really into like 80s goth rock bands. A big band for me actually was the Mission UK. I didn't grow up religious at all. I had no idea you could study this stuff academically. I also did my undergrad in medieval history and religious studies. You know, as I age, um, hopefully get less pretentious. I think from listening to my bio, people can sort of guess that I was a pretentious youth and a pretentious man, but I'm hopefully moving away from that. The hallmark card cliches are much more profound. And, and sometimes the truths that seem overly saccharine and simple are very deep. And for people like us who, you know, love these complicated ancient texts that you need to understand a thousand other texts and bodies of philosophy to engage in, something like the Secret Book of John, which is, you know, a meta text. It's commenting on so much. You can just spend the rest of your life just on that text. I think that there's some resistance to embracing some of those hallmark card platitudes. You you have not only top gnosis, but you have pop gnosis. So you have some Gnostic cultural landmarks. Gnosticism, the esoteric, is shockingly and surprisingly influential. Now, I'm not saying the Gnostic church or my Gnostic church or the Gnostic church movement is, but Gnosticism itself, it's always sort of lurking in the background of Western culture, right? It's the ghost that can't be exercised. And it bleeds through in many different vectors of influence, as well as a lot of artists kind of finding even Gnosticism, maybe not diving that deeply into it, but being captivated by the narratives. The Gnostic texts are very meta. It's commentary on religion from within religion. I argue it's it's actually presenting a different way to be religious. But, but I think that that early meta is something that a lot of people grab onto, even though it's very mainstream now. Mitch Horowitz's Occult America is a book I always uh, recommend to people because it's, it's very readable. But, you know, he goes into the enormous influence at all. All sorts of kooky esotericism had um, many influential streams of, of American thought, both mainstream politics, culture, high culture, pop culture, what have you. And uh, it makes it easier for people like us, right? Because we can just point towards some different pop culture things to explain these interests. I think as well, something we say on, on the show uh, a lot, is, uh, you know, if Gnosticism is true, if any of this stuff is true, or it has some kind of truth, then it is just going to bubble up without these vectors of contamination. It's, it's going to be present because it's woven into reality. But that said, I won't make any statements on that. But if we're going to speak uh, academically, uh, shockingly influential in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. You think of something like, even as recently as Barbie. Barbie is making a billion dollars at the box office. And that was like, to me, I don't know, just this is my personal opinion, but like when I saw that, I appreciated it because it was basically this almost like the secret book of John, it, but all that nerdy stuff aside that I'm seeing in it, it's like you said, it has that meta conception of the world that you understand that you think is reality is not. And you have to take a journey to understand that and try to get back again. This concept of breaking the bounds of reality. And, and I totally agree with you. The concept of Gnosticism, I agree with it. Like. In an April deconic sense of, like she said, the Gnostic New Age, it's a new way to express your relationship with the divine, the, the spiritual and, and the profound. And I think that people latch onto that because there's something we innately find fascinating about looking behind the veil, like it's the Wizard of Oz, right? A favorite of mine, a favorite of yours, I know, Dylan Burns, his favorite saying about the Sethian Gnostics is that the Sethian Gnostics were basically Slayer. It was yeah. Slayer. And I look at the Sethian Gnostics as almost like, the gothic industrial section of like the dark scene you know there's that disenchantment in music you know it's something that we spend a lot of time on to the point of a uh, cliche right you know we've done 200 episodes so i'm hoping a new audience of people who don't know talk gnosis is watching this i try not to be too repetitive and, and of course it's uh, an interview show with lots of guests so i'm not always talking that much i'm asking questions but but something that that jason uh, my co-host on talk gnosis uh, jason memo and the host of pop gnosis keep coming back to over and over again right is gnosticism as a kind of narrative gnosticism as art the esoteric as art religion as art the trans 
transcendent experience that we can have through art being the same as the mystery found within religion. This is really what the Pop Gnosis show is all about. I, I will talk about sort of Gnosticism in popular culture, if we're not talking about, you know, fiction. In culture, you know, the, the term, it's very easy to find now. It, it really has come back in negative ways. So people all over the political spectrum and the religious spectrum and what have you uh, now call whatever they don't like Gnostic or Gnosticism. So, you, you know, I, I think it was Harper, uh, Vanity Fair, it was one of the big glossy middle brow magazines. A few years back, they did an article uh, about QAnon as Gnosticism. I can't think of, of a counterpoint, but it's a very very, very, very common right-wing trope that uh, anything that, that they don't like, from transgender folks to sex education to, I, I don't know, there's a wide range of things that they don't like. That's Gnosticism. And of course, this is more than recent. You know, there's a long history of churches calling whatever expressions of Christianity they don't like Gnostic. I've noticed but there's been an uptick on that. Again, both in obviously more conservative thinkers and movements and communities, but, but I've also seen it in liberal Right. So I've seen like more liberal expressions of Christianity say that, you know, that this is Gnostic. Something else we talk a lot about on the show is conspiracy theory. Right. So the conspiracy theory has exploded. Uh, it's not going away. And, you know, a lot of conspiracy theorists have embraced a uh, form of Gnosticism, uh, whatever you want to call it, what they think is Gnostic thought. And again, that, that can be kind of negative. Right. As in the I mean, it's all negative, but their their perspective. There can be the, the, the oh, the, there is there's a secret group of Gnostics who are ruling the world and we have to defeat them, right? There's a Gnostic conspiracy. That's one version. And then it's opposite, which is, you know, we're the true Gnostics. We need to wake up. You know, the UFOs are coming to save us, whatever. And to be fair, there is sort of conspiratorial themes in ancient Gnosticism, for sure. But that said, I, I think this is taking it into a very uh, negative direction. Uh, you know, something I've been thinking a lot about and that I'm doing a little bit of academic work on is, you know, influences that come from something good don't necessarily stay good, right? You know, look at Christianity and Jesus' teachings of love, right? And, you know, bad things have, have come out of this wonderful movement. So Gnosticism being secretly influential, I, I think sometimes this influence does get twisted, does get perverted, and maybe you can actually draw a line back to Gnosticism, but it's a, a very perverse take on it, if I'm making sense. Maybe there can be a direct influence. So that's why, you know, it would, what you're doing and uh, people like you is so important, right? Because people are going on YouTube and Googling to find out more about Gnosticism and whatever they think it is and, and whatever they think it's bad. So it's it's good to find perspectives that are more true, more real. Although I'm always careful to be quite open with my definitions and thought about Gnosticism. I'm quite open to, to a number of takes, although you can probably tell what takes I'm not open to. It's always a, a delicate dance, just in general, right? The, the To stay open without being so open that, that you don't believe uh, in, in anything. You said something important, something that I, I talk and think a lot about, um, and uh, my co-host Jason as well, which is, uh, you were talking about the Gnostic narrative that's found in Barbie, and you said something interesting, which is the coming back, right? And that that's the part that's left out, I think, from a lot of people who are genuinely interested in Gnosticism, are engaging with ancient texts, uh, consider themselves Gnostic, and are maybe not part of any organized movements, right? But are not the kind of people that we just finished talking about, if I'm making sense. There's a lot of people, and this is a cartoon of Gnosticism, that if you grab somebody off the street and they know something about Gnosticism, this is probably something that they'll say. If they recognize the term, this is probably something that they'll say, which is it's, it's all about getting out of this world, right? It's all about getting out of this dimension. It's all about beaming up uh, out of this dimension into a better dimension. I think that that's been sort of an obsession of mine lately, which is pushing back up against that, because it's really, I think, a misreading of, of uh, and of course, when we say Gnosticism, but it's a misreading of many texts. It's a misreading of The Secret John. And that coming back is, is the important thing. Now, you know, viewing the world as, as an unending suffering prison, I think is not what they were saying, right? But, but they are saying that, that the world is inherently flawed and we have to find a way to, to live in it. And there's obviously a lot of metaphor and allegory in, in these texts. Uh, I'm not comfortable saying that they're all metaphor, all allegory, but it, it might be healthy for, for people to think on the allegorical levels, right? To get over this wanting to get out of here. I think the the other thing too, and this, this is also something that you'll hear from a lot of people who maybe are involved with whatever it is that, that I like. 
<laughs> whatever that is, which is Gnosticism isn't about, about hating the body, trying to get out of the body, and it's not about a, a mind-body split. Now, Gnosticism, the secret book of John, it, it has issues with the body, as we should. A lot of times, I think when it's talking about the body, it's, it's really talking about the passions. It's saying the same thing that it, the, all of its contemporaries at the time were saying. I shouldn't say all of them, but most of them, right? So the, the, what all, all the middle platonics are saying, what the other Christians are saying, all the, the big movements in uh, Mediterranean and late antiquity, right? That there's some troubling things when engaging with the body that we should be aware of, that we do have to to be aware of the passions and deal with them. Now, that said, I, I think that one of the big parts of the Gnostic message is that the human being is divided, right? And the human being is contradictory. And, you know, the Gnostics were the only ones saying that, that the human being is divided. It was a very common thing at, at, at the time and continued to be a common thing. Actually, a lot of the times we think of mind-body, but as you know, many uh, ancient Greco-Roman thought that continued on and throughout the Middle Ages is that the, the human being is divided into basically body, mind, soul, body, soul, spirit, however you want to phrase it, right? It's kind of funny how we're more simple than the ancients, where, where most people just divide it into mind-body. And, and I think that that's a big mistake. That said, you know, I understand where the confusion comes from, right? But I, I really do think, again, to reiterate, that they were getting to that, that the human being is divided. The human being is contradictory. And they're emphasizing that. It's not just found in Gnosticism, of course. And I'm always saying that it's not just found in Gnosticism. The thing is, is Gnosticism is because it, it is meta, because it's intertextual. Obviously, it's taking all this stuff from, from all these different movements at the time. But it's the way that it's combining them and highlighting them, right, that makes it unique. But uh, St. Paul, to paraphrase him, you know, he's always saying, why do I do the things I don't want to do, you know? A big mystery that's sometimes answered with uh, because people are sinners. But I, you know, I find that quite profound. And I'm somebody, as we all are, we, we have that death drive, right? We're all self destructive. But I, I am a person who can be his own worst enemy. And I've, uh, you know, had brushes with, with strong self destructive periods. And that's always left me to ponder though, why do I do the things I, I don't want to do? So there's the things I've been thinking a lot about, talking a lot about. You know, at the same time, I'm always careful. You know, again, Again, obviously, I was joking at the beginning about being humble, but it is an obsession of mine because I can fall quite into certainty, and I really do need to be humble and to practice it. It is something uh, there. So my mind is closed to certain interpretations of Gnosticism, basically the ones that we talked about, these conspiratorial misunderstandings. But I'm more open to people who are reading the ancient texts, who who are trying to put it into their spirituality in, in some kind of healthy and authentic way, right? And that can be a wide variety of people. So I'm trying to be careful not to make myself the Pope of Gnosticism, the one who has all the answers. The other thing as well, uh, you know, I, I do believe that, that there's something like truth. But sorry to get into cliches, but it's, uh, you know, that's something that people probably heard a lot, that truth is like a, a diamond that has many faces, right? So it's, it is important for me to be challenged, to hear other people's perspectives. And I think that, that, that that's it for, for everybody. And again, I, I think that reality is contradictory, right? I keep coming back to that point, in which I think that the ancient Gnostics were getting at. So that also is a call to be humble, you know, to make sure that, that I don't have it all figured out, to make sure that I listen to other perspectives. And this is something Father Tony, who, who used to be on Talk Gnosis, you know, he, he, he summed it up uh, again with people going out for coffee with him. He once told me, you know, I say Gnosticism is hard. Maybe you want to do something else right? Again, that actually sounds like a humble brag. You know, I'm so much more enlightened than other people. I'll take the hard road, but but I don't think it is. It is hard and it's something else I'm trying to figure out that, that I, uh, I, I, we were talking about earlier. People can tell what my present obsessions are, which is, is to be so broad, but to not be so broad that there's nothing there. It's, it's, it's very challenging, right? The, the, the adaptability and flexibility, I think it's a fuzzy logic. I think you, you always have to be open to changing your mind, to being surprised, to embracing different perspectives, and even embracing different perspectives simultaneously. And all of this is difficult for me, but I think it's worth it. So the death drive is something you even find in the Gnostic texts themselves, right? I'll just take, for example, the book of Zostrianos. Right? Zostrianos is on the verge of like killing himself before he has this revelation. He drives himself into the desert, you know, even if it's not Gnosticism. Like you look at something like Fourth Ezra, the character in that is doing the same thing. He's completely on the verge of like a breakdown before they have this revelation. I think people who are attracted to the Gnostic conceptions of looking at the world 
understand like seed of Seth, right? You're a sojourner and a stranger in a world that you thought was your own, but it's not, you know, at the end of something like Zostrianos or Alleghenies, they don't just stay up there. They proleptically go up to the heavens, but then they come back and then they help other people. People forget that. Like when they create these like scary buzzwords, like Gnosticism and the modern heresy hunters, the new pseudo Hippolytus is out there, <clears throat> Ron DeSantis. I think it speaks to something of our condition of being a person. We all feel like we don't belong sometimes. We all feel we're our own worst enemy. You know, I think for me, like what's fascinating is that we tend to, when we look at these things, and this is why I focus on so much from antiquity on my show, I think a big problem with a lot of shows on YouTube that just focus on biblical archaeology or textual criticism of the New Testament and have these like airy fairy conceptions of Hellenization and Judaism and Christianity. It's a lost opportunity to understand this world as it really was because these people are all living together. Just going back to Dylan Burns, Apocalypse of the Alien God is all about how Sethian Gnostics are in Plotinus's circle and they're arguing and using the text that they have. These people are not living in a vacuum. Imagine being somebody in the third century common era who like goes through half of their life as like whatever, then they convert to Sethian Gnosticism. And then they live the rest of their life as a Sethian Gnostic. And they're working side by side with everybody else in the world. They're just going, they get up. It's not like something changed and they're like cloistered like the people at Qumran or something. They have to get up and go to work every day, just like everybody else. What would it be like to live as a person who believes this stuff, but they're still going to work side by side with other people who have different beliefs? They don't have a problem with it. And I think about the whole concept of, as John Dillon would say, the underworld of Platonism. And, you know, Gnosticism is part of that, but not only Gnosticism, you have things like the Chaldean oracles, you have things like Hermeticism, Corpus Hermetica. I'm reminded of that beautiful text in the Corpus Hermeticum, Poimandres, right? There's still a concept of like a fall. There's still a concept of separation, but like Voucher Hunograph would say, it's a love story at the end of the day. The first man and matter see each other and they fall in love. And it's not a negation of the body at all. I think it's a lost opportunity that we don't take into consideration that these people are just like going to work like everybody else. And they're not like spooky people in the shadows, like meeting in catacombs. Nobody can know about Yeldabaoth, you know, but us, if we like just put them into little categories that are nice and shiny. We miss the beauty of this period of time. Music is a big favorite of mine. I noticed the Black Iron Prison series, you do a lot of music artists and things like that interview. I'm always interested in I, what are some of your favorite bands and, you know, if they have any intersections with Gnosticism. For the most part, they, they really don't. You know, like many people my age, our age, your musical tastes are to fossilize, right? <laughs> and I'm still a huge music fan, but I never thought that it would not be a huge part of my life the way that it was in my 20s, right? I could just lay in bed and just listen to the same album on repeat and do nothing else. And going to live shows, you, you know, I'd go to, to fear sometimes four live shows a week. And the passion is not there as much. But in all of my answers do uh, don't seem that impressive. But I, at the end of the, the day, uh, I'm a big fan of power pop. So a lot of uh, uh, later power pop bands. I like a lot of uh, kind of 60s poppy psych, like the Beach Boys. Uh, there's a great touchstone. I, I like a Calypso. So I listen to a lot of lately, like a lot of classic, like, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s Calypso. I, I like Pink Floyd a lot. I've come back to Floyd in my old age. Just about every era of Pink Floyd. Y you know, there's kind of a myth that after Sid Barrett left and before Dark Side of the Moon, that there's no good Pink Floyd. But it, there's actually some really great stuff in that period. I, I think that's because of Umma Gumma is such a stinker that, that it, it scared people off. So I've been listening to a lot of that strange period of Floyd lately. I was in a power pop band in, in my 20s in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You know, we were on a bedroom label. That was a lot of fun. Just about everything I do like, usually I, I like stuff that has a strong melodic line, right? So something that is catchy. <laughs> I'm the same way. Like, I'm not really into like guitar wankery. I don't care about elaborate solos. Like, I'm into stuff like the Dandy Warhols, Brian Jones, Tom Asker. The most important thing is like, it's almost like a mantra and the rhythm guitar is very simple, but it's very effective. Before I had the bedroom label, when I was younger, I had this really bad goth rock 
band that like self release stuff. It was funny because like um, the tail end of it was when I was st- first starting to go to like community college because my dad's like, well, if you want to keep doing this, you got to go to college or get a job. So I'm like, well, I'll go to college. I did commercial music management and we were recording some songs and the audio production guy, uh, Joe McDermott. So thank you, Joe McDermott for that class. He was recording the song. He was like, Jason, there's like 300 depressed German kids in, Ger- in Germany who would love to hear this. That was kind of the point of time when it, it was pretty obvious that music was not going to be a steady income at all. And then I discovered history and religious studies. So I did that, but like, I love the melodic stuff, like the Gothic 80s stuff. Like, I think even when I was like a, a younger kid growing up in the nineties, I think like the first year I was really into music, like I was into like all the normal vanilla stuff like Pearl Jam. But then when I was 13, my dad sat me down and it was almost like an initiation. This is like as close as I can think of to an initiation. He played Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures for me. From then on, I was like that weird kid who like listened to the goth and stuff. And everybody made fun of me because I spent all my money on Cure posters and albums and stuff. Oh man, just, you know, 20 year old me would be horrified when asked about music. I said the Beach Boys and Pink Floyd. But uh, uh, do you know the Wake, the, the 80s British bands, you know, kind of like Joy Division y? Um, yeah, yeah. That, but, but think about like the Beach Boys is like so influential, that wall of yeah. sound, that Bill Spector wall of sound. I'm sure like the 18 or 20 year old kid that we were would like cringe at some of these bands. But... I was going to start talking about the, the Five Finger Satellite re releases and uh, the Swirlies, the stuff that was, you know, so hard to find that you would go through heaven and hell to get, right? And now I can just get every Swirlies album. I'm also a big fan of, of Shoe Gaze. I'm trying to think of anything else to close on besides being pretentious about music. It's Hocknosis. Everybody, go listen to that watch that it's on youtube or whatever podcatcher that you listen to feel free to drop me a line if you ever want to jaw about anything that we jawed about today thank you for for your service i'm really glad that you do this show for the reasons that that i already said if you go to youtube now we we used to get like at least a thousand hits per show and you know the algorithm changes we're at like two three hundred but of course it could build up over time right because they they live online you know we get about two thousand listens you know about every show I would say maybe the average is 3,000, which is which is not that impressive in this day and age. But that said, I, I get a lot of kind emails from people, like what you were saying at the beginning of the show, that the show has been very meaningful for them, right? That, that it's had an influence. And I'm going to bring this back to you, which is, you know, in Hinduism and Buddhism, there's this idea of, of the Kali Yuga, right? That there's these cycles of time where where the, the world degrades and eventually the, the cycle changes again and we return to a golden age. And the cycles are very, very long. And right now we are in the, the most degraded of the cycles. We, we are in the, the Kali Yuga. And they, they said something very interesting in the, in the age of the, of the Kali Yuga, you know, just doing one act of kindness, just calling on the name of Buddha once is so much more impactful than in the other ages, in the golden age and in the middle age, right? It's much more impactful because the world is such a mess. So, you know, what you do is so much more impactful than it would have been in other times and more impactful than it feels. Because, you know, I really do think that we're in a dark time right now. So anybody doing any kind of shining a light, I think is doing a beautiful and important task and is lighting up the darkness more than they think. So that's what I'll close on. Uh, thank you for your service. Jonathan, thank you so much. This has been an honor. Thank you. And, you know, everybody at the Gnostic Wisdom Network for everything you do. 